picture as there is in the heavyweight division. Yeah. He has the ability to do everything. You think he can, George? No doubt about it. He just got to think big, act big, and fight big. If you think small and you're big, you won't be able to do it. You just got to think of yourself as the giant and be in control. I like a fighter when he's at near his benchmark weight, when he is quick, has stamina. I don't know of any case where adding that much weight in this short a period of time has really helped a top heavyweight. We've looked long and hard through boxing records to find another case where a trainer trained one fighter in a championship fight in any weight class and then came back to train the other fighter in a championship rematch. But that is the case for Emmanuel Stewart tonight as far as we can tell. It has never happened before. And now Oliver McCall, who won a coin flip, and I say won the coin flip because he has the right to come out second and now can make Lewis wait in the ring, has so far made no indication to us that he's going to come out of that dressing room. So, Despite the fact that he knocked out Lewis, he is a three to one underdog, largely because he looked lethargic beating the 45-year-old Larry Holmes and looked like he had slipped himself a Mickey when he lost the title to Bruno. But he may be one of those fighters who fights better as a challenger when there's something to win than as a champion when there's something to defend. You've known those kind of guys, haven't you, George? Yeah, sometimes it's easier to get yourself all worked up when there's something out there to gain. When you get it, figure you only have something to lose. It's not easy to fight like that. Very few fighters can do it. If you saw the fight in London, September of 1994, you might remember how wildly worked up McCall was as he made his way toward the ring that night. He's an emotional guy to begin with. Well, it sure looks like he wants to fight. Well, he decided not to make Lewis wait after all as he runs into the ring with his various entourage members trailing behind. In the blue corner, wearing black, weighing 237 pounds, he brings a professional record of 28 victories, 20 by knockout against six losses. This evening he plans a return to glory by proving his victory over two and a half years ago against the man he now faces was not a fluke. Ladies and gentlemen, from the Windy City, Chicago, Illinois, introducing the WBC number two ranked heavyweight contender, the former WBC world heavyweight champion, the Atomic Bull, Oliver. And across the ring in the red corner, wearing white trimmed with a Union Jack, weighing 251 pounds, he's a 1988 Olympic gold medal winner, who now, as a professional, has a record of 29 victories, 24 by knockout, with only one defeat. And tonight, he has the chance to regain this title by avenging that lone loss on his record. From East London, England, presenting the number one ranked WBC heavyweight contender, former WBC heavyweight champion of the world, Lennox Hughes. All right, hey, now, hey, now, step back. And now look, now just a minute. Hey, that's right. Oh, wait a minute, Greg. Uh, Manny, 
If he goes right there, I'm not going to call it low, all right? No problem. We've already gone through the instruction. This is for the title. I expect a tough, clean fight. Protect yourself at all times. Any questions from Mr. Lewis's corner? No problem. No Mr. McCall's corner. Let's get it on! Jim, you might call this the civil trial after the criminal trial. Let's see if the verdict is any different in a new venue with a new set of jurors. And speaking of the venue, a three-year absence from the major boxing scene for the Las Vegas Hilton. But you may remember some of the times you've been here in the past. For Leon Spinks's upset of Muhammad Ali in 1978. Michael Spinks's upset of Larry Holmes in 1986. The night that Mike Tyson knocked out Trevor Burbick to become the youngest heavyweight champion ever, that was here. Julio Cesar Chavez's dramatic 12th round KO of Meldrick Taylor behind on the scorecards. That was here as well. Round one begins. Emmanuel Stewart said that he expected Lewis to be tentative for the first few rounds of this fight until he shakes off the memories of his loss to McCall in 1994. The memories of that one punch. Stewart goes on to point out that Lennox is by nature a cautious counterpuncher at the beginning of his fights anyway. Amid all of his turbulent emotions the last time around, McCall effectively followed the fight plan put forth by Stewart. Does he have another plan tonight? In the early going of the first fight, there was such a look of intensity on McCall's face. He looked like he was in labor. He's been much calmer coming into this round. Come on, let's go, come on. Mills Lane asking McCall not to jump on top of Lewis and try to maul him as he's done a couple of times early on. What about Lennox Lewis's jab, George Foreman? Let's face it, Lennox Lewis can win this fight with just his left hand. If he settles down and just uses his left hand, he won't have any problems at all. Just keep his right hand at home until it, until it creates itself. From long reach, he can do it. Lewis has a long-standing tendency to paw with the jab or to hold it out there and leave it there. Is it getting any better? Well, he's got that reach, and when you have a reach like that and the power like that, you can do anything you want, so long as you're not breaking the rule. That time he hooked after faking the jab. The hook off the jab. And I got to say that now that we see Lewis in the ring with trunks on, 251 doesn't look bad on him. Well, he's got a great body. There's no doubt about that. He can conceal it. Trunks are a little high. When you have that much reach, Lewis can have Oliver McCall slinging and going wild all night and not be able to reach his head if he just stands back, uses his reach. Good body punch by McCall. And when you're 250 pounds, you don't want to be hitting the body much. of a feeling out round for Lewis. Call made some noise early and has been largely acquiescent in the last two minutes of the round. McCall jumped on Lennox Lewis, which played right into Lewis's hand. Here you saw the very eager McCall leaping into the ring before the fight, he didn't seem that eager Listen, during the first the round. Man. Use the jab, use the jab, you'll hit the guy with something. Don't run in, Oliver, because this guy's trying to set you up. He's jabbing, he's out jabbing you. Right, okay. But you got to out jab him. Okay. Let's take your time and you'll hit him. Don't be anxious trying to hit him with nothing big. Just use the jab, you'll see the big shot. You understand? Now, but stay on top of the guy. Yeah. Keep him going back. Don't you go back, because this guy can't fight too well going back. He can't throw punches. But if you let him come forward, or if, out. if you Seconds let him come out. forward, go. he's going to be able to hit you. Come on, Manny. 
George Benton asking Oliver McCall for more aggression, saying Lewis can't fight if he's going backward. McCall was unable to make Lewis go backward in an effective way in the first round, and Lewis comes out and establishes that pumping jab at the beginning of round two. 49 of Lewis's 57 thrown punches in the first round were jabs. He didn't land but 10 of them, but he set the tempo early. Yeah, you know, Lewis has got to be patient, of course. He's going to be a little reluctant because of the earlier fight in that right hand. Let this guy rush him. He's, his corner told him to charge, Lewis, but you never want to follow and charge a puncher around. That's when you get yourself hurt. Come on, quick grab it. Come on, I'm going to quick grab it. You want to make a puncher chase you because he's not effective going forward. And as McCall threw two wild overhand rights, you saw how wary of that punch Lewis is. Now, there's a good stiff jab by McCall inside, his best punch of the fight so far. And Lewis demonstrates exactly what Benton talked about, doesn't throw punches when he backs up and opens himself up by dropping his hands. Instead of coming in and clutching or punching, he backs up and leaves himself open. Hard right hand by Lewis, and he just misses an uppercut that might have done even more damage. So Lennox Lewis begins to throw the right and takes advantage of the charging McCall with that uppercut. Yes, on this occasion, rather than backing up, he threw the uppercut when, when McCall was charging him. And McCall ducks his head and looks away as Lewis misses over his right hand. Lewis suddenly finding something with the uppercut here in the second round. That's going to slow down McCall's charges, although here McCall gets to him with a left and a right. This one knows two. 250 pounds start working against you. You can't just bump up into a guy with that much weight all night and not start feeling it, the results on your body. Call trying to land the right hand over the top again. This time Lewis blocks one and fires his own right hand. Lewis definitely looks gun shy when McCall releases the right, but aside from those moments, he's getting the better of Oliver. Now, this is what you call backing up. Lewis is doing a good job of backing up. Uh, really, you call when he was back, he was running back, but that's not backing up. But he's fighting a good fight, go, moving back. Another uppercut lands in there for Lewis as round two comes to a close. A round largely dominated by Lennox Lewis's uppercuts. Okay, you got to keep your right hand up. Your right hand is getting a little sloppy, okay? Keep the right hand up and start getting to him a little bit first, okay? You got to finish the second round. You got to start breaking the hip a little bit more. You let him initiate a little too much. Hip, hip, break it up, but you got to start to look faster. Your hands are coming from too long, okay? And the boy's nothing but a, if you want to look at his family, you want to see how bad he looks. Anytime he's running, you're going to put his eyes down, but don't go to the rope. Try to go in a circle and keep your hands up. George, is he throwing this uppercut correctly or from inside or is he too far outside? Well, this is a big man. He's way up there. He'll never be able to throw a perfect uppercut because he's coming from so, his arms have got to go down to the level of his opponent. So, and there you saw a good right hand later in the round. It's going to, it's going to turn out a bolo no matter right what. By Bloodstat numbers in the first two rounds, Lennox Lewis has virtually doubled Oliver McCall's punch output. McCall releasing 57 punches. Lewis throwing 111. 91 of those punches counted by our punch stat numbers figures were jabs. Lewis criticized throughout his career for bad balance, getting a little steadier on his feet now as round three begins. Lewis is doing some good boxing, although Oliver McCall is not putting his punches together. He's trying more to psych this man out rather than whip him. Are you suggesting, George, that he's trap shooting, looking to lay a trap and just land that big right again? More than anything else, trying to uh, wait around and fights go quick, you know.
for Lewis. Finding, as George Foreman points out, opportunities to box effectively. Yeah, that's what he want to do is to box, move around, save his power for when he sees something perfect. Oliver McCall has got to mix it up and make this boy get wild with him. If he can make Lewis get wild, then he can get that right hand in again. But as long as Lewis is able to stand flat-footed, flick the jab, and keep McCall at a distance like this, there isn't much Oliver can do. That's true. Three minutes goes by real quick. You got to remember, Oliver McCall was a bit smaller the first time they fought, so that right hand came was delivered a lot quicker. Interesting to see what kind of stamina McCall has tonight if this goes into the later rounds. Remember, he was in rehab for one of his multiple substance abuse problems at the beginning of his training camp. Lewis now landing hard right hands from over the top behind the jab. Now Lewis, if he wants, he can just do that all night. Why change anything? McCall is doing the acting job because he can't do anything else. McCall starting to look around and mug for the crowd as though he's either bored or frustrated. One thing he's not doing for the moment is winning rounds. He's hardly fighting right now. He has so much confidence in his stamina. He's been in with some of the good boxers before, and later on, they wear down. Good combination by Lewis. Left hook and a right hand over the top. McCall dancing as if to say, you can't hurt me. But Lewis is piling up points easily against a two-passive Oliver McCall. That's what you want your fighter to do. Win every round. If a knockout comes, good. That was almost a two-point round. Lewis was so dominant. I gave you two rounds, I gave him another one. So you got two rounds in the bank, okay? Right. I gave you one and another one to him, okay? Working the jab, feeling all right? Just take your time, son, and start ripping him to the body a little bit now, okay? But you have not pushed him back in you will not start pushing is doing a very strange thing here, folks. He's walking around. He's wandering around the ring. He hasn't gone to his corner, and he's trying to figure out what's gone wrong, why he's not into this fight. The people in his corner are looking at him and wondering what's going on. And you can see the disgust on George Benton's face. I wonder if that's against the rules or not. Harold, you know anything about that? You're supposed to stay in the corner, George, but I tell you the truth, he doesn't have to sit down. You don't sit down, for example. I started but you to are say. supposed to stay in the corner. You can't wander out into the middle of the ring. The referee should have definitely got it back to a corner. Oliver McCall threw a total of 15 punches, according to our punch stat numbers in round number three. And here he takes a hard right hand to begin the fourth. So whether McCall is disgusted with himself, his corner, the referee, Lennox Lewis, the whole occupation of boxing, who knows? Lewis seems unsure what to do as McCall occasionally looks away from him and invites him to attack. This is a bizarre scene. Bizarre scene. What should Lewis do, George? Well, you got to stay within the rules. Don't break any rules by hitting your guy behind the back or something like that. Then you can get yourself in trouble. It, Sooner looks, or later. it looks like he's quitting, and I'm surprised that Mills Lane, in his 19th heavyweight championship fight, hasn't gone over and said something to him about, you got to fight, Oliver, you got to fight. That's what Mills should be saying to him because he's not doing anything. This is one of the strangest things I've ever seen in a championship fight. Well, on Tuesday of this and week. And he's shaking his head at George as if to say, there's something wrong, I got nothing here. Unless he's playing fight. the greatest game of possum I ever saw. Right hand by Lewis. McCall able to take it even though he had his hands down. It's got to be a difficult thing for Lewis. He's aiming punches at a sitting duck here. I don't know if the referee should let a fight like this go on. I mean, this is not what audience yeah, now, now Mills Lane is going to call time and have a conversation with McCall. McCall has thrown one punch in the round. This is a bizarre display. I personally have never seen anything like it. He's not even looking at Lewis as he walks away. As far as you know. All right, let's go to Larry Merchant, who's with George Benton in McCall's corner. Larry? This man's a mind is man. George, you're saying that you think something he snapped in there? Well, you're watching it. You, you ever seen anything like this in your life? Never. 
Did you see any sign of anything wrong with him during training? No, never. Did you see any sign of him, of anything in the dressing room before the fight? No, nothing. Do you think the referee should stop this fight because he's not fighting back? I won't, I'm in this man's corner. I won't voice no opinion on that, but hold on. You see this man, he's still there. All he's got to do is fight. Thank you, George. Well, Oliver McCall's been talking religion this week, saying that he has found God in his life. That's his new mechanism for attempting to deal with all the problems that have haunted him in the past. Tuesday, he told a group of boxing writers, I'm going to retire after this fight. It's not godly to train for a long period of time to go out and try to hurt another man. Then Wednesday, at a pre-fight news conference, he said, no, no, I'm not going to retire. I will keep fighting after I win the championship. But something interferes with Oliver McCall's motivation as think, round four closes here. Jim, I think this fight should be stopped right now. Yeah, the fight shouldn't go on. I wouldn't want to see I mean, this like is a farce. What is the old saying? The first time is tragedy. The second time is farce. There's something wrong with Oliver McCall. He's near tears now. He doesn't really want to fight. He's crying in his corner. I've never seen anything like this. He's overwhelmed with some sort of emotion. Don't do this to yourself. Don't do this to yourself, man. Come on, come on, come on. Thanks a lot. He doesn't want to fight. Come on, sit down, man. Sit down. I'll have to sit down. Now, you want to fight? Huh? You don't want to fight? Yeah, you want to fight. Come on, man. Come on, come on. 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 Come but it doesn't show on his face. McCall's share of tonight's purse amounts to close to $3 million. If I was in the commission here, I would hold that, that purse up. This is a disgrace. It's almost like you're watching a man come apart at the seams. Well, right in a life filled with eyes. crises, Oliver McCall is having one right now before the eyes of the world. And it's placed Lennox Lewis in an awfully difficult and awkward position. Lewis doing what he has to do. This isn't right. You wonder how much longer Mills Lane will allow this to go on. And that's, that's gonna be it. Well, I've seen some strange things in boxing. That is surely one of the strangest. With a whimper, not a bang. Lennox Lewis has just become the WBC World Heavyweight Champion for the second time in his career. Mark Ratner, Executive Director of the Nevada State Athletic Commission, joins us now at ringside. Mark, your take on what you just saw. We are going to hold up his purse. We are not going to let him cash his letter of credit. We're very upset with what happened. We'll have a full investigation. He will not get paid tonight. It did not appear as though he wanted to fight. That is correct. We're very upset. Thank you very much, Mark. So now Larry Merchant goes into the ring, and George, that was painful. Yeah, but this guy's had a painful life for the last few moments. He's been under counseling for drugs, and believe me, there's a great lot of young people in that fix, in the same fix he's in. Someone's going to have to help him. The last thing he needs in his life is the pressure of boxing right now. Yeah, that's a lot of pressure, and the crowd is cheering, and you really, I wanted to just get up there and embrace him and let him know it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay because what do you what do you go from here? Let's hope let's hope he can pr continue to pursue the path of religion in, in which he now believes, and uh, that that can be the reconstructive mechanism in his life. Yeah, believe me, there are a group of people in this country who's in the same shape he is, and they really need us. And this guy is in bad shape, and he needs us. And I don't know. I'm sorry to see the boxing crowd see something like that because. Maybe they're not un they're unfamiliar with it, but we see this every day in the lives of our, our young people who got mixed up, got on the wrong side of the, uh, the track, and they can't get back on. George, you're a devout Christian. Your belief in God is the central motivating factor day to day in your life. Has it ever made you feel like you did not want to box? No, this is a job. It's a profession. Remember, there are people out there who are in his condition, who are airline pilots, stewardesses, stewards, you name them, we do everything. and so. They've probably felt like that. I don't want to go to work today. 
Let's go to Michael Buff for the ring announcers for the official particulars. Ladies and gentlemen, here at the Las Vegas Hilton, referee Mills Lane has to call a halt to this bout. It comes as Oliver McCall refuses to defend himself, referee declaring a technical knockout at 55 seconds of round number five. The winner, and now a two-time WBC heavyweight champion of the world, the pride of Great Britain, Lennox Newell. A stunned crowd at ringside here at the Las Vegas Hilton. You heard the booze. You saw some people throwing cups of ice and beverages on McCall and his entourage as they left the ring. Greg Page removing the gloves from McCall's hands and McCall discussing with bystanders over there whatever it was that motivated him to stop fighting in the middle of his proposed championship battle with Lennox Lewis. Larry Merchant stands by with the two-time WBC heavyweight titleist. All right, Lennox, congratulations, I guess. What did you see? Well, I think the main thing is, you know, I went out there and, and just asserted myself. I didn't allow him to come in too much. I think he found it difficult to get through through my jab. I was just playing with him with my jab, just popping it out, waiting for him to make a move. And, I, you know, when he started walking away, I thought it was a joke at first. I thought he was trying to nail me into something. But then, you know, it kept on going. So I just picked up the pace and just continued. Do you on. think that his idea was to come out, try to land one more big right on you and end it? Otherwise, he really didn't want to fight? Well, you know, the first time we met, I realized that it was a lucky punch, and I told the world that it was a lucky punch, because he doesn't have a, uh, enough skill that can contend with me. The main thing, I just went out there and just, you know, put my jab out, and he couldn't really contend with that, and, you know, basically gave up. Do you think he was having some kind of a breakdown in the ring? I don't know. I wore these white trunks for a reason, but, you know, one... What, what was the reason? Oh, just to, look, just to look good and have a mental kind of uh, stress on him, you know, seeing me come out as a, you know, as a gladiator in, a, in some sense. What do you want to do next? Next, I want to get in the ring as soon as possible and just continue the, the winning uh, success that I'm having. Thank you very much, Lennox you. Lewis. And now I'm with Emmanuel Stewart. Emmanuel, first I have to ask you about Oliver McCall since you trained him for the last fight. Tell us what you thought happened. I think uh, he almost got like a miniature breakdown emotionally. Uh, he was very frustrated. I think the size of Lennox totally had him in awe. And, and after trying to get in, Lennox did what we told him. It was not a hard jab. It was just a continue like a range ranger jab to just keep him at a distance and keep him frustrated. And we figured about seven, eight rounds we would knock him out. But he just got totally frustrated because he could not effectively get in. And I think it just got to a point, being that he's such a high, strong, emotional guy, that he just said, forget it. Did he, in some sense, revert to being a sparring partner after that? I think to a certain degree he did resemble a lot of the sparring partners that we worked with. And we had watched a lot of George Foreman's films, believe it or not, and we went back to just use that. We called it so all the time steadily filling him with a left hand and being ready to take a step back with your right foot as soon as he comes forward. And it worked. And mentally, it just broke him down. He was so, when a guy is really charged up and wired up the way that he is, it's very easy to confuse him. I recall, and I mentioned earlier, that after the first, then just before the first fight, he, he seemed wired up beyond being wired up. We thought he was having a breakdown before that fight. Yeah. He came in in a much more low-key way this time. What, what did that signal to you? He could never attain what he was that night. That's one of those uh, unbelievable highs. They tried to do it, and that was why Lennox's orders was to not do nothing aggressive. The first round was to clinch him, wrestle him up, throw him down to kind of slow him down. A lot of what Evander did to Tyson. When a guy is really wired up, you wrestle him and do different things to kind of slow him down and get him out of his room. And after he got of that charged up mode, it was just a matter of time before he just got frustrated and said, I quit. What did you tell Lennox between rounds? Because certainly I, you probably have never had a fighter faced with that situation. I thought that Oliver was up to a trick. He was just trying to sucker punch to get Lennox to come in. So the first round that he did that, I was a little cautioned. But the, after the, the last time I saw it, I said, just go out and charge him and put a combination of punches together, and he's going to quit. This, this question. I've heard stories of uh, Emmanuel that after this fight, you may go to train Mike Tyson. Would you comment on that? 
I'm with Lennox Lewis. I've, everybody's saying this but me. So you yeah. haven't negotiated, no, and you are anyone. you are Lennox Lewis's trainer. I still got work to do with Lennox. We got to fight, I guess, in May against uh, Akinwanda or whatever, and then hopefully after that to fight Holyfield, probably uh, whoever Tyson. Thank you very much. Back to you, Jim and George.